Today I want to talk about the Musical Fidelity A1. I've heard so much about it since its recent relaunch. Lots of my colleagues uh, have done video reviews and then in the press and everybody's been really super hyped up, very similar to when it first came out back in 85, I remember that. I thought, well, I want to get hold of one for review. Couldn't get one for review because, yeah, there just wasn't one available, so I bought one. And uh, yeah, I had to wait a little while, but I've had it now for a couple of weeks and I've listened to it a lot, so I've got to know it really well. And I thought that what I would do is really talk more about how it sounds to me. I'm even going to do a little video at the end of this, uh, a music video comparing this one to the Sugden A21 because they're very similar. I'll talk about that in a minute. So you can actually hear the difference recorded in this room through the Sibelius using exactly the same microphone setup and settings, everything. Um, I know it's not very accurate, but it's for fun. And I know a lot of people like at least to, to listen to it and try and detect things. Um, and I'm also going to talk about, obviously, the features and compare it with the A21. And I want to sort of reflect on who would buy it and, and why. Um, so let's, let, let's, let's get started. Um, the Musical Fidelity A1 started its life in 1984, its earliest one. By then, in 84, the Sugden A21 had been made nearly for 20 years. I mean, it was came out, I think, in 67. OK, it's changed over the years in different versions. And in fact, there are a number of different versions of the A1 that came out after the Mark I, the Mark II, the Mark III, and the, the final edition, which was completely different from this one. It looked the same, but internally it was different. So I want to compare the two Class A amplifiers um, as I say, so let's uh, first of all just look at some of the features of the amplifier. Well, it's got an on-off button, it's got a blue light here instead of a red one now. You have a, a volume control in the middle, that's been greatly improved since the previous version, which often used to get noisy or even break down. And then you have this normal and direct button, and it's quite interesting because I thought, oh, this direct means that when you push the button in, you'll basically hear everything at full blast. It doesn't mean that. It just means it's bypassing the amplification section of the preamplifier, but the volume control still works. It still has an effect. It's just effectively dropping everything down by about 10 or 12 dB. And if you've got quite high output CD players or, or streaming equipment or DACs, then actually you might find that very useful. I was using it all the time with the in the um, direct mode and found I still had plenty of gain. I got nowhere near halfway around the clock with the volume control, nowhere near. So there's loads of gain on this amplifier. And from that respect, the specifications are really good. I will put all those in the description below. I'm not gonna go into a lot of technical detail on this amplifier. There's loads of people who have done this already on, on, on the internet. Um, the British audio file is one and there are many others and, and the online reviews too. You will find all sorts of technical history stories on it. Um, and for me, to be honest with you, I'm not really that bothered about how a manufacturer gets the sound. I'm much more interested in what the sound is and do I like it? And is it sustainable? Will it break down? And let's be fair, the A1 was famous for breaking down and, 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 and it was not reliable. But of course, Audio Vertrieb in Germany own Musical Fidelity today. And I believe the owner of, of Audio uh, Vertrieb, uh, which is also owns the project brand, um, loved this thing. Apparently it was his first amplifier and so he always wanted to bring it back to market. So what has he done? He's taken the original um, designs on the acquisition of the of the of the musical Fidelity company and is having it assembled in Taiwan. And obviously in Taiwan you have a number of really good factories and, and manufacturing uh, facilities that are able to handle quite high volumes at certainly very high quality and therefore get that that 
model price down, the unit price down, which is important. So Paul Sugden, who decided to continue manufacturing in the UK, which is good, I suppose. I mean, if you're living in the UK, it's very, very good. Um, and they, they manufacture there, then their unit costs of much smaller numbers, I'm imagining, are way higher. So if you compare the Sugden A21 um, in price, which is about 3,000 euros, and the A1 for Musical Fidelity is only 1,600 euros, including taxes in, in, where I live in, in Europe, in Belgium. So, in fact, you know, this is almost double. And for, for 3,000 euros, you don't get the phono input. The, 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 so you can't hook a turntable to the Southern unless you pay an extra 400. So it's 3,400. So it's a little bit more than double the price. But for me, money isn't an object. I mean, it's not that relevant. Of course, the depends whether you're paying 30,000 or, or 500. But generally, I wanted to know, and I was really curious, how would this amplifier sound with our Sibelius loudspeakers? Because it's class A, tick. I've always liked class A amplifiers. It's 25 watts per channel with lots of gain. So I'm thinking, you know what? That's more than enough to drive these nicely. And it's a classic, and it's one that I've never owned before. My brother had one, I think, a long time ago. Um, and so I just thought, no, I've got to get one of these in the studio. And here it is. So, yeah, so beyond this button here, you've got the selector switch from CD, tuner, phono. Very traditional. And, of course, you have a little remote control. And this re remote control is really, really nice. I like this. Um, I think a lot of manufacturers should look out for this because this little guy feels nice in the hand. It's not heavy. It's got a volume up, volume down and a mute button. And that's it. Now, I can get out of my chair, luckily, to change input selection or change a CD or change an LP or, um, you know, with streaming, you can stay where you are. But I really like the idea of keeping this simple. What I don't like are remote controls that come like this. And this is the Sugden remote control. And it's got a volume up and a volume down. And it works really well. It's, it's really precise. So it, you, it, tactile, really nice, nice to hold. Okay, it's plastic. I don't mind that. It's, it feels nice. But you've got all these buttons that don't do anything because they were designed for a CD player, which they had years ago. That I don't think they even make one these days. So I find that really crazy. Now, obviously, they probably just got a lot of them in stock. And for ecological reasons or financial reasons, they want to just use them all up. I don't know. But I do get fed up with volume controls with buttons on them, which don't apply to the piece of kit that you've got. So after that rant, I would just say I like this. Also, the angle worked pretty well. Um, and it was very good. If you push the, the button just once slightly, it would just go up like about 1 dB. You could really control the volume, which is a really, really nice thing. So from that perspective, it's great. Inputs, outputs, almost identical to the Sugden A21. Um, five inputs, I believe, and then you've got the fixed uh, pre-out, and then you've got a tape-out, exactly the same with the Sugden A21. So in that respect, there's nothing to really tell them apart. Neither of them have a headphone amplifier, which is a, maybe a good or bad thing, I don't know. The design of this amplifier, when it came out, was considered revolutionary. But if you think about it, I don't think it was, because Armstrong had a 621 amplifier, which to me looked very, very similar. Uh, yeah, indeed, they had silver uh, controls on the front, but the Armstrong was really sleek and this sort of narrow and the cut in little thing at the bottom here. I, I, I think it was in, I think Tim, the Paravancini was uh, influenced by the Armstrong design. Now, I don't know who designed the Armstrong. Maybe Tim did, I don't know, but... So how does it sound? How does it compare sound-wise? Well, when I first plugged it in, when I first started using it, I didn't like it, to be honest. Um, 
because it wasn't very detailed. And I think that's something which Steve Guttenberg talked about as well, that is not as detailed as other amps. But you have to bear in mind that I had been listening to the Sibelius speakers with the Sugden SPA4, which is 75 watt per channel class A, and it's probably the most detailed amplifier I've ever heard. Um, in, a, in a nice way, you know, that the, you, you hit, all the instruments are beautifully separated um, and the soundstage is really wide. This was not like that at all. In fact, it was very narrow. Well, not very narrow. It was just normal. It was, it was narrow. It was much more like um, a, a pass labs, for example, in 25. And very similar, ironically, to this guy up here from English Acoustics, the Stereo 41C. These two are very similar in characteristic. I've only just sort of realized it, thinking about it, that they both got a, plenty of bass, um, really warm bass. Um, and yeah, this kind of centrally focused image. And I was thinking this morning, how would I summarize the sound of it? And this is going to be really crude, but I would say if you listen to music, then this amplifier would be really suitable for you. If you listen to musicians and if you listen to their instruments, then you might be disappointed after a while, especially if you have the chance to compare it with something that has more uh, detail in it, like, for example, the 21SE from Sugden. This, um, because it's not very detailed. It presents you a whole sound. It's, you could even say it's quite natural in that way, because if you go to a, a classical concert where there's no microphones or amplification or anything, and you're sitting you know, a few rows back, you get a whole sort of warm sound. You get a, a homogenous sound. This is what you'll get. What I like to listen to, what I particularly enjoy is the detail, the hearing, the breathing. There's a track from the Oscar Peterson trio called You Look Good To Me from the We Get Requests albums. And it's very famous. A lot of audiophiles kind of know it because it starts with Ray Brown uh, bowing his double bass and then plucking. And you can sort of hear him half sing and half mumble. And with the musical Fidelity A1, I didn't notice it. I mean, I wasn't listening for it, but it just, everything just sounded nice. And I thought, you know what? Oh, I didn't hear Ray Brown muttering. So I go back and say, oh yeah, it's there. But if you put on a detailed amplifier, it's in your face. You really hear it. It's like he's standing there. You can hear and hear him breathing. You feel, hear the rosin on the bow hitting the string and the detail in that bass. You don't get that with this, but you get a very, very relaxing sound that once I started listening and chilling out, I could listen for hours with this amplifier. There's no question of getting any kind of fatigue, listening fatigue with this amplifier and this kind of design. And I think that's probably why it was very successful. Um, also, if you've got um, loudspeakers with quite, I would say, an aggressive high frequency top end, which a lot of them are these days, it, it was a trend that started in the mid 80s and, and kept on and then it, um, and it sort of became even more present in some manufacturers and people have got to really like that sound but if you've got a sound that you're finding a little bit too harsh or aggressive an amplifier like this will be a perfect combination how does it compare with the a21 well with the a21 you have a wider soundstage. When I'm listening to Linda Paloma from Jackson Brown, it's a track I use a lot of the time. I drive everybody nuts uh, around me when I'm listening to it because I use, I refer back to it a lot. Um, you know, those guitars left and right are way beyond the right and left speaker. The instruments are really separated out. 
The A21 is not as wide as the rest of the Southern range, but it's wider than this one. The instruments with the A21 are clearer defined. Jackson Browns has a little bit more sibilance because it was in the recording. You'll notice that with the A21. With the A A1, musical fidelity, everything, everything sounds nice. It sounds warm. It sounds holistic, as I say. Then switching to the, you know, you look good to me, as I said earlier, that you, you with the A21, you will hear uh, Ray Brown's mutterings clearer. They'll be more defined than the musical fidelity. Does it mean the musical fidelity is bad? No, far from it. Um, it's just that they are deliberately different designs. Now, both of these amplifiers get hot. Everybody talks about how hot it is. And when you open the box, the first thing you'll see is a sign saying, warning, this thing gets hot. Do not put anything on it. And absolutely, I mean, now I can't touch that for more than half, you know, a second or so. It's getting really hot. And if you have a room that in the summer gets to like 30 degrees inside, then this is going to get really hot. That's not a bad thing. Cars run hot. Their engines are typically running at about 90 degrees centigrade. They're designed to run hot. This is designed to run hot. The, the new version has improved quality components. It's got ventilation left and right, uh, little openings. And the, the um, heat sink, which looks like a doesn't it look like a, a grill for grilling steaks on? You couldn't grill a steak on it, but you could probably cuddle an egg on it. Um, is in one piece, but it's designed to get hot. A A21 is designed to get hot. You have no choice. If you have a Class A amplifier, and this is a little trick I learned from Gary Morrison, the amplifier designer. He said, Harley, if you want to know whether an amplifier, a Class A amplifier, is true Class A all the way, then look at the power output and look at the power consumption because the power consumption should be about four times the output per channel. So if this is 25 watts per channel, if it was in class A, it would consume something like 200 watts. It only consumes 130 according to the specifications. So that's showing you that it's in class A, but it's going to slide into A, B at a certain point when it needs to deliver its maximum power. So, and it's the same with the A21. I don't know what the consumption of the A21 is. I've never measured it. It's, it's, not, it's not mentioned on the Sugden website. And um, so I don't know, but if you've got a class A amplifier, it's going to be at least twice as hot as the output per channel. So 130 Watts, you know, you're going to have the equivalent of a, basically a 100 watt light bulb sitting in your room on all the time. And that isn't necessarily an issue, is it? Because in the old days we had a, our 100 watt light bulbs in our room and we didn't really complain about it. The thing is, you can't put anything on it and you must not put anything on it. Um, but it's not like a, a stove that's going to burn somebody's hand. Well, I think I've talked about these two enough. Maybe it's time to play a track, which is uh, Claire Teal um, singing, um, well, I will put it on the screen. I'm going to set up these two now and we will compare the A21 and the A1 together and then you can choose which one you would go for. Now, just before we do that, I want to end with who would, who would buy this amplifier? Who would I recommend it for? And I think I would recommend it, well, for the people who like listening to music and are not really analytical and want to really analyze and listen to all the different instruments. So my wife, for example, would love the sound of this amplifier. Um, she is a really, what I call a holistic music person. I'm much more analytical. It probably comes from my recording background than my playing background. But would I recommend it to a, a young person starting out on their first hi-fi, like this was mostly for people who bought their first hi-fi, I probably wouldn't, you know. If I wanted to go with a Musical Fidelity brand, I would probably choose something like an M5S. 
it's a tiny bit more expensive but you've got a DAC built in and everything and maybe that's just got a bit more functionality on the other hand if they've heard this sound and if they've compared it with an M5 and they say oh wow I love this sound then this is an amplifier for people who are looking for a very specific kind of sound and in the old days we would call it the British sound warm and forgiving so that you can play any kind of music pop some Led Zeppelin through this and uh, rock from the 70s everything will sound great bad recordings will still sound great with this amplifier because it's not that detailed the detail is there but you have to listen for it rather than have it delivered to your ears I hope that makes some kind of sense well if you have been thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video bye I